If members are content, content with the minutes of that date, I'll sign them into the record. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members, uh, agenda item three on the matters arising. We have correspondence uh, in your packs from Mr. Richard Pengelly, the accounting officer of the, for the Department of Regional Development. Um, Mr. Pengelly has provided an update to the committee's report measuring the performance of NI Water Procurement and Governance in, in Water. In his letter, which is available at pages 10 to 19 of the electronic packs, Mr. Pengelly addresses recommendation 8 of the committee's report, which is in regard to the private supply of pipe leakage. Uh, an economic assessment of the possibility of implementation of a subsided supply pipe replacement scheme was carried out by DRD, and this can be found at page 12 of the electronic packs. Mr. Uh, Pengelly states in his accompanying letter that the economic assessment does not support the uh, introduction of such a scheme, but notes that he has asked DRD to develop policy proposals for a new piece of primary legislation, which will uh, include consideration of these issues, and that an update, a further update will be given to the committee when this legislation is in place. Would members like a minute to read through the correspondence from Mr Pengelly? Kieran, do you want to come forward just if you want to make any comments on this correspondence from Mr Pengelly? Anything you need to add? Yeah, no, I think this is welcome. Um, we we'll go back to the um, winter a few years ago. A big issue was when the pipes burst. A lot of the pipes were on private premises rather than the public network. And uh, even in normal times, uh, more than a quarter of all leakage on supply pipes is leakage from customer pipes rather than the mains. And uh, in England and Wales, water companies have a policy of offering free or subsidised repair of customer supply pipes, but this is not available in Northern Ireland. So this is what uh, the Minister is now proposing to look at. I think uh, the committee did uh, make a recommendation on this uh, a couple of years ago, so that, that is welcome. Okay. Members, does any member want to make a comment? Or? We can tend to note the correspondence from Mr. Pengelly. Yeah. Note it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Um, members, um, as this legislation will be a DRD exercise, members, would members be content if we referred this to the DRD committee uh, with a request for the PAC to be kept updated on the progress of this? Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, uh, members. Uh, we have uh, correspondence. Um, in res uh, response from the Audit Office in relation to the canine breeders of, of Ireland. Um, members, I think Kieran and um, Richard and Neil. This is a piece of correspondence we've received from the Audit Office. Um, if members have any questions regarding the items, we can, we can put these to the uh, Audit Office. Um, this is we're in open session, and, um, and any action points coming out of this may have to be discussed in closed session. So, okay. uh, Trevor. Yeah, I, I note the, uh, the correspondence from uh, and Lisa. Let's put the table today. Um, Sorry. Suppose chairperson of the coming a wee bit. I acknowledge this because I've been working closely with the Kenyan breeders for some time now. Even when I my time on Dard, and I'd be very supportive of the case that they're making, given that. Um, these dogs were seized and eventually returned to their owner with a strong suggestion that actually in a worse state they were whenever they, were whenever they returned. So I, I think there is a there is something in terms of, I mean, I know Karen would want to speak to this, but at the end of the day where you have a public authority supporting a charity to lift dogs and being paid for by the public purse, 
and as suggested in some of the papers that we have seen, I don't know if you've seen them or not, Chairperson, the bills were turned in a worse state. Yeah. It would call into question in my mind that whichever public authority was paying for it, they obviously, given the USPCA felt the need to lift these dogs in the first place, and return them in a worse state than what they actually lifted them, said something first of all about the care of the animals and actually what we are actually paying for as a public authority or the public authority actually paid for this. So in terms of, and I mean I think it was the other way round, um, we, we would all be shouting and dancing off the ceiling in the assembly, criticising others who keep dogs in a state that's on keeping for an animal. But whenever you get a charity that's, organ that's involved with uh, the removal of these dogs and then brought back in a worse state, I think it calls into question how public money has been used to care for animals. So I think this does warrant, I mean, it, I'll be interested to hear what Karen says, but I think it warrants a full investigation in terms of how that charity operates and how public money is dispensed in the organisation of that as well. Thank you. Trevor and uh, Karen. Yes, uh, was <coughs> most in-depth knowledge of this. So. Um, clearly, there, there are issues here, but to, to address the, the issues that you've just raised, um, suspect that it would probably be done better in a, a closed session since it, there, there is some information which the committee needs to be aware of. Okay, thank you, Neil. Trevor? Chairman, as I, I said to you, I said I appreciate what Neil's saying and I, I will take guidance. I, I think sometimes, yes, you go into closed session, but one of the things that strikes me at this committee is it's a public accounts committee. And, and I struggle that we spend an awful lot of time in private session. And I appreciate there is things that because I agree on there's legal ramification for some of those things. But I, what I suspect were possible, I think the public would have more of an interest when we are a public accounts committee, that we could do as much of the business in the public session and less in private session. Because um, I think, and I was very critical of this when I was in local government, I think um, for our own credibility, I think people need to know exactly what requests we're asking as well and what's <coughs> coming of that. And I appreciate what Nate's saying. There may be occasions where in terms of legal opinions or things like that, that we'll have to get into a closed session, but I prefer if we could keep this as long an open session and as much of a discussion around those issues that will be permitted and less of it in closed session because there's people out here look to the USPCA and other charities in terms of perceived good works. Mm -hmm. But the experience from the canine breeders in this case is where good works might not have just been so good. And, and there's, I, I think that we have a duty in terms of keeping the public informed of actually what's happening with some of these organisations as well and what actually the outcomes were because the canine breeders have a difficulty getting recognition for the case that they brought against that charity at that particular time. Some of us have had an opportunity to read some of the files and see some of the pictures but I think it's somewhat shrouded in a mystery for others and the more we have this in public as opposed to closed, the better. Thank you Mr Clark. Um, Deputy Chairperson. Chairperson, this brings back uh, you know, ancient memories of being first elected to a council Korean many years ago and having this debate about uh, making decisions behind closed doors. But then with age and a certain level of maturity, you realise there are things that need to be discussed in private. If there are legal implications, financial uh, things to be considered, and uh, it took me a long time to realise that maybe by having something in public, you are actually assisting the very people that you want to deal with. I, I have nothing. I, I have nothing against what uh, Mr. Clark is saying. Absolutely nothing. And uh, it may well be that there should be uh, some kind of study into the uh, performance of charities and how they deliver the service, but we do need to be very careful because these organisations are dependent on subscriptions and all sorts of things and certainly don't want to damage that in any way. But this one here is rather interesting because there's two aspects to it. There was the seizure of the animals mm -hmm. and then there was the fact that the animals were returned in a worse condition. Those <coughs> two completely separate issues. And I'm happy to go with yeah, what other people say. Um, we, we do have some information that we really would like to give you in closed session. Yeah. That should not preclude going into yeah. opening I, session, session, 
I'm I, sure I appreciate that, that some uh -huh. information may be commercial and confidence, and it's coming from your office. So, uh -huh. and, and, uh, but, and uh, I do yeah. respect what Mr. Clark said also, and Mr. Uh -huh. Dallet. Um, there, I mean, Trevor, if there's any other aspect of it that you want to discuss in public, and then yes. we can move. Well, well, I suppose. I mean, I don't know much members are aware of the, are familiar with this particular case. But certainly it would satisfy me if we could get a conclusion or a consensus from the committee in terms of that the USPCA um, weren't particularly covered in glory in this particular case. Because the, the, the problem is everyone looks at a charity. I mean, there's an awful, an awful lot of charities out there do excellent work. But I think whenever there's wrongdoing, it should also be recognised. Mm -hmm. This organisation will be in the, fr the front of the television tomorrow night if they find horses in a bad state and they've had to seize them, and quite rightly so. No issue. But wherever they go and take dogs from a breeder and bring them back, and it's been recognised and brought back in a bad state, this organisation doesn't put a spokesperson up to talk about that case. And what worries me about this is we're going to have a close session to talk about it, and there is a cover-up in terms of how that organisation's off in the, in the midst of the night again. Now, I would prefer that we, we weren't even having this conversation about an organisation as like this, but when I seen this case, it changed my mind in terms of what I thought was a good organisation, the works they were doing, to a situation where a man had his dogs removed and brought back in a worse state. It actually calls into question, and I think the sooner we have that conversation in public, the better. Now, I, I take on board what Cairn's saying, and I, I fully understand that there's occasions where we have to talk about these other aspects in, in private. But if we can get a consensus that the members are agreeing that UP, USPCA haven't covered themselves in glory in this case, and then we'll talk about the other bits behind closed doors, I'm happy enough. I'd agree on that. Yeah. Neil? Um, Chair, in terms of the consensus that Mr Clark refers to, it's probably relevant to note that um, this case has already been through the civil courts, yeah. and the USPCA uh, was obliged to settle mm -hmm. with the respondent. So there has been a legal process. The, the USPCA has been held to be negligent Great. and there has been a sum of money settled and that's all in public domain. Okay. Mr. Again, without pushing the boundaries too far, the sum of money, the arms in this primarily should be the public money. Mm -hmm. um, public money went from the public purse as a result of this court settlement. Did any money go back to the public purse? Sorry, Michael. Did any money come back to the public purse as a result of this court action? No. What I would suspect, be it in closed session or elsewhere, would be our primary concern. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. And, and that, I suppose, that piece of information that you've just given us is very relevant to the, to, to you know, the issues that Mr. Clark was talking about. And I suppose. This is an incident that we are aware of. It's, there's been a court case, and they have proved to be uh, negligent in, in that instance. Um, there's a lot of good work that has gone on within the USPCA, and that obviously has to be recognised as well. But this is an instant, instance that we are talking about, a particular case. And Mr Clark, are you happy enough that we go into closed session to discuss further? Um, now that that is, a number of things have been disclosed in, in public session. I, I'm happy, Chair. I mean, and that, I think that will be in order to agree. But I mean, I'm just pushing the boundaries slightly here. But it'll be in order then, given we've had a discussion around the table about this, and the members are present. That that you actually issue a statement as well in terms of this piece of work that has been done, and acknowledge the fact that this committee is accepting that there's been wrong done, wrongdoing by the charity as well, and that. Obviously, whatever follows in our conversation later, but I think now that we're in public session, if we can get an acknowledgement that this committee agrees that we get some form of statement in terms of acknowledge the wrongdoing, and we've asked the uh, controller and auditor general to look at the particular case in terms of public money, and then whatever conclusion comes out of the private session. Yeah, I yeah, that's that's uh, there. There may be issues that are relevant, so we would yeah. we would have to wait till we hear what. Um, the audit office has to say. Yeah, they wouldn't regret us putting a statement out, of course. Um, yeah, well, it, it may and it may not, but we'll have to hear what the auditor sure, has that, to say. That would only preclude us if we include the bits that say, see, 
um, in public. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think if we can agree that we're going to do some form of press statement over the particular subject to support the Cambrian breeders. I mean, one of the things, and the other thing that actually happened in this chamber, and we've heard about it and we talked about, we're always down on dog breeders, puppy farms, and all the rest. And we have seen USPCA involved in wrong doing. We've always tried to stamp, and the breeders, here the breeders have come out on the right side of it, but they haven't had their day to actually tell their story. Well, I suppose, but as chair of the committee, before I would agree to put out a statement, I would need to read over all the correspondence that we have had. We have had correspondence going back, I think, to September and October of 2013, you know, albeit I take on board what you are saying and absolutely share <coughs> the same sentiment. Uh, so can we agree to go into close? Yeah. Agreed? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Okay. Um the committee has received a memo from the clerk of the Culture, Arts and Leisure Committee regarding our report on decal management of major capital projects. <laughs> In response to our consideration of the MOR on this report at our meeting last week, and this is at page five of your packs, the committee requested uh, to receive further information in relation to this MOR, and the clerk of the CAL committee has asked if the information that we receive uh, in response to our request could be shared with the CAL committee. I have no problem with that. Uh, if it's av and it is available before the 13th of March. They're looking at yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Members are content for that. That's our fault. Yeah. They should have been yeah. looking over it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so members are content to share that piece yeah. of information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, members, just one other piece of information. Um, mm -hmm. On note training, the one note training. Mm -hmm. um, members, uh, you'll be aware uh, from the PAC and other committees, greater use has been made now of our electronic devices and documents. Um, now that both members and staff have become more familiar <laughs> with the tablet devices, what are they? You and we'll say nothing the about the tablet devices. <laughs> Refresher training has been offered to committees on the OneNote system. And this is a software package from Microsoft which can be used for note taking, collecting and organising and sharing of information. So if members are encouraged to avail of this training in order to get full use out of your tablets. Particularly during uh, committee meetings. I think I think we're being threatened. Yeah. So this it sounds this it sounds like the pieces of paper are going to start to disappear. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think somewhere were we told that you could have your papers I, until uh, the end of the mandate? Is that today? I, I think it's the end of the century. Would be how, how end of the century. Paper disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't have. Them. Members, this training is available on two different occasions, Wednesday the 26th of February and Thursday the 13th of March, between 12 and 2 on each of these days, and the training session lasts for 30 minutes. Uh, 30 mi I won't even know how to turn it on 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be, this training will be delivered by a member of this committee. If you wanted to do it within this committee, it would be um, Danielle or Taylor who will be delivering the training for PAC. So the clerks will send out a reminder to committee members um, before each session as a reminder if you want to avail of that. We'll have to. And under protective markings on committee documents, members, the committee office has recently been considering protective markings applied to papers received by committee, and they need to continue with, and the need to continue with the current arrangements on protective um, markings. So Trevor has been working with us on the committee staff. Um, so Trevor, you want to speak a wee bit more on the protective markings? Um, as you're aware, members, most of our documents contain the confidential marking, and it is a higher classification that would normally be applied in other committees to documents. Um, the outworkings of the, um, that classification is that members don't see papers until you walk into the committee room, more often than not. 
Um, there's also issues in terms of um, the committee staff putting together the papers because with this marking on it, each paper has to be printed individually. <coughs> so that can cause further delay and you often don't yeah. get them until after the meeting has even started. And there's also the fact that we can't include confidential papers in these ECP systems. So um, we have been considering how we might address this. Now, obviously it came about as a result of the leaking of documents and it's something that needs to be borne in mind if we do change the markings. But um, we have assessed the markings we currently apply against the Assembly's protective marking policy. And the highest marking that our documents usually would need would be that of restricted, in which case we could provide it in your committee packs as opposed to needing to deliver it at the time of the meeting. Um, obviously, to going forward, it would be a case of considering every document and some merits, whether or not it needs to be um, considered as confidential. We would propose retaining the confidential marking on the Audit Office uh, briefing paper, issues paper, and the draft report. Um, Really, going forward, if members are agreed, um, the proposed option would be to reduce the marking of all of our confidential documents to that of restricted, with the exception of those uh, audit office documents, and any other documents that we're provided with that may be deemed necessary to continue with that marking. Um, so that's really your option. If, if members are of a view that it might be worth reducing. <coughs> Chair, I think this was, I appreciate that it was done to really stop information going out, but within this committee I think there's a level of trust starting to build up that most people know that, you know, we're not in the, it's not in our interest to actually try and leak stuff out and it's not in anyone's benefit to do it. I think the way we are working is quite, quite effective, but to maybe reduce the workload upon and the difficulties associated with that, um, I think we need to try it, suck it and see, as the man says, and see how we go with this. But the major issue is the fact that members don't see the documents until... Yeah. Well, that, that, that can be a difficulty, but I, I genuinely believe that there is, uh, and whether it comes down to members signing a, a code of conduct within this committee to ensure that we all abide by it, and um, certain pieces of information could be easily identified where they came from anyway, if that were the case. But I think I think we have to there has to be an element of trust here. And after, at the end of the day, we are supposedly uh, responsible people. And if we're not, then that's another issue. But I think if we have to deal with sensitive documents, we deal with it in that manner. Each and every one of us receive correspondence into your constituency office on a daily basis, which is of maybe a highly confidential nature, and we have to deal with it on that basis, and I think that that's the way it should be dealt with. Yeah, it's up to each individual to uh, you know, address it appropriately and how they um, deem it confidential and how they treat the documents that is given to them. So. Chairperson, I've been in this committee for 14 years. There was one occasion when somebody leaked a document <coughs> which was inappropriate and was wrong. There was a knee-jerk reaction to that. Close to Police, or, sorry, the ombudsman was involved, all sorts of things. And in hindsight, what did it achieve? If somebody who's going to go out and leak a document is not going to leak it with their name on it anyway, are they? Uh, so if we're going to use tablets and we're going to make better use of time and allow the clerks better use of their time, then we need to stop this. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members. Sorry. The documents that still will retain the confidential marking. Um, that's fine. That's one no problem. way we can deal with those is rather than you seeing them just as you come into the meeting, is if we deliver them prior to the meeting, say the Friday, um, but we mark them as confidential and we double envelope them. Um, so one of the first envelope will have confidential in your name on it, and then the second plain envelope, and we'll deliver them to members, and you can sign out for them. That's okay. And bring them along to the meeting, and we can okay. come back just after the meeting. Sure, you would probably be better to live in than a Monday. A Monday, yeah. We wouldn't be yeah. here on a Friday. I think like that's Dennis Trevor is saying that that's actually in line with um, our information policy. assurance policy. Um, so yeah. I would agree with Sean. There's no mail out of this place anymore, so that was all taken off us. Monday, we'll collect them. Monday. Works. Okay, members. Thank no you. mail now. Um, Another piece of information just on the uh, school visit, um, as we mentioned earlier, um, it's Milburn Primary School in Coleraine. The plan is for those attending to visit to depart from here at 1.30.
um, to be in Coleraine for 2.30. Um, so any any uh, member who needs uh, transport accommodation or transport provided, let the clerk know. Um, the transport will be leaving from what, here. What date is that? Remind me. Remind us here. When is that? 5th of March. 5th of March. Kieran. Right. Oh, um, we're putting out a press release on our report on Tuesday. But yeah. mm -hmm. I'll take the liberty of actually mentioning the fact the committee's gone on the school visit yes. to give yeah. it a bit of yeah. fair play. Yeah. Yes, that yes. Yeah. Order? absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, yeah. I would just hope, Chairperson, that everyone takes your advice and turns on. Because <laughs> it's a big act of faith to actually do that. Let's make sure every member of the yeah. committee yeah. they're living. <coughs> Is, is the school in the town centre? Or where yeah. is it? Yes. John knows it is. It's John's taking us and treating us. It's on an artillery road. <laughs> Head towards London. Right? <laughs> it's not yeah, far off. <coughs> it's not far off the ring road. Oh I'll bike the main oh, road. Yeah. Okay, members. Um so you'll email everybody out anyway and let them know and yes. to let the clerks know if you need transport. That's okay. Kieran, you won't be joining. Are you joining us? Of course. Oh, yes. I can, yes. yeah. Um, yeah. I think the, the, um, our team, Suzanne in particular, uh, mm -hmm. will know this school very much. She was out at it. So right, good. okay. She'll know the people. Okay, very good. So your team's very welcome too. Uh, All right. That'll be great, yeah. Okay. Okay, members, um, no other business. Um, the next meeting is next Wednesday in room 29, next Wednesday being the 26th of February. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran, and your team. Thank you. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee room 29.